Hi there, my name's Oshin Lunny, and welcome to episode one of season five of Audio Talks, presented to you by Harmon. In this episode, we're going to explore diversity in the music business, why it matters, where we need to be, and how we can all get there. And I'm honored to be joined today by two music industry leaders who are driving forward the diversity agenda with inspiration education and action. Welcome to the podcast, Andrea Gleason, the CEO at TuneCore, indie and international billboard power player and US ambassador at KeyChange. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be on. And bienvenidos to Martas Paleres Olivares, who is the head of international press and PR at Primavera Sound and a panelist and keynote speaker. Buenas tardes. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Okay, let's start the conversation with the big questions. And I'd like to put this to both of you. We'll start with yourself, Andrea. Talk to us about what diversity means to you. How would you define it? So for me, you know, I head up to Core, which is a digital music distribution platform. And, you know, we're at the heart of music and tech. We are going through a big transformation period. And when I think about setting up the best service possible, that means bring the best people on to help me with that. And one thing that's super important to note is that the more diverse thinking you can bring to the table in a company, the more ideas you're going to have there and it's going to progress thinking. I think of Abraham Lincoln, which is one of the famous U.S. presidents who really abolished slavery in the U.S. And he's famously known for that he took everybody that he ran against in his presidential election and put them in his cabinet, really for that reason, to diversify thinking, to progress thinking, and to make change. And so when we think about being at moments in the industry and in time that we want to take things to a place that it hasn't gone before, it's very important to not have people around you that are going to think the same way as you, but think differently. Because one plus one equals like five in some cases, because you're going to come up with something that you didn't think of and you morph into something new. And that's why for me, diversity is super important. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree. I would like to dive into that a bit more a bit later. Coming over to yourself, Marta, now we actually met via an article on the incredible, mouth-watering, brilliant, diverse lineup for Primavera Sound. We spoke uh, when I interviewed it in Forbes a few years ago, and you've been pioneers of this. But talk to us a bit about, you know, from the viewpoint of somebody who runs this incredible festival, what does diversity mean to you? I strongly believe that diversity is or should be a place uh, where no one feels underrepresented or misrepresented. Because, for example, in my vision of of life, living in Barcelona, maybe my way of understanding diversity would be focused precisely on having more women. But for other people would be having more people of color. For other people would be uh, having more gender and uh, sexual diversity in their companies. So I think that diversity is precisely a very diverse word. And when it comes together, as Andrea was saying, many different people with many different backgrounds is when you really realize what diversity means. Because, for example, here... In, in Spain, maybe we don't have too many people from African origins that are still working in our industry. But of course, in the U.S., you can't avoid talking about race uh, when we are talking about diversity. So it's a diverse panorama that I think that in general should mean that everyone feels represented uh, some, somehow and then we can learn and we can be challenged because it should mean also being uncomfortable. Diversity should be uncomfortable until it's not uncomfortable anymore. I should be challenged because I can think that my environment is not diverse enough because I would like to have more women here. But maybe I'm not looking at the incredibly white environment I may be working in. So it has to be challenging. I have to be pushed. I have to be thinking of questions like this. What is diversity to me? To feel my own inconsistencies, to feel how maybe I'm not diverse enough and I think that I'm pioneering something and that's simply not true. So until the moment that no one feels uh, misrepresented or underrepresented, diversity should be even more and more broader than, than we know now. Absolutely. Uh, I'm a great believer that the magic happens once you step out of your comfort zone 
And from what you're saying there, diversity is very much about exposing yourself to more viewpoints. And I interviewed a gentleman called Tony Fish, who does risk analysis for the financial sector, a very smart person. And uh, he basically says, you know, if you walk into your boardroom and you, you look at your board of directors and they all kind of look a bit like you and they all agree with a lot of the things you say, you are just setting yourself up for disaster because it's only with that kind of 360 diverse viewpoint that you will be able to see problems as a group that a single viewpoint will absolutely not be able to see. So I think, you know, there's so many good reasons for having diverse boards, diverse lineups of festivals, and really kind of hard coding diversity into who you are as a person, as a company. I love that. Now, Andrea, come on over to yourself. You spoke about the importance of diversity in terms of performance. And this is not, it's not tokenism. It should be core to how companies approach the world. Have you come across any data that can illustrate this for our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, I really think diversity is important on two fronts. One is for uh, companies and two is for the individuals and Mm. they complement each other. McKinsey actually does a study. Uh, They started doing it in 2014 and then updated every two to three years. And they measure exactly this. What is the impact of diversity on organizations? And when we look at gender, the top quadrile of companies with a more diverse executive team were 25% more likely to have above average profitability. Wow. Then if you start looking at it through the lens of ethnicity and cultural diversity, the findings were equally, if not maybe more compelling, that the top quadrile of companies outperformed those in the fourth one by 36% on profitability. So Ultimately, just to get to the punchline, companies that are more diverse have been shown to be more profitable. So there is lots of benefits for companies. And then also for the individuals, there are very, very talented people that just don't have the same access to opportunities and to resources. But if we can provide a more equitable environment where we focus on this, because again, companies can be personally benefiting from this. And providing that hand up. It's not giving a hand out. Mm. It's about giving a hand up. I I think of it kind of like when I went into undergrad, you know, you have to take a test to find out like where you are with your math level. And uh, if you are just a a little bit more like, you know, some things just off the bat, you can skip some of those pre like math classes. I wasn't one of those. Uh, I had to do the pre math class (laughs) in order to do my statistics class. Yeah. Guess what? I was really good at statistics, but I needed <laughs> that other class to like reaffirm my foundation, yeah. right? Yeah. So it doesn't mean that I, I'm not capable. Yeah. You just might need a few extra things to help you get that stepping stone up because you just didn't have the same access to resources, opportunities, maybe your white male counterparts did. Yeah. You know, like we live in a society where, you know, you kind of like forget like, what your environment is and maybe what you're exposed to at the dinner table every day. And you just have that built-in knowledge, but there's very, very talented individuals out there. They just need that hand up, that stepping stone. And it's mutually beneficial. It's like a win-win. It's my favorite kind of, I I say this with my team all the time. It's like two birds, one stone. You know, if we can build, and we'll talk a little about this a little later on some things that every company can do or every individual can do to make a more diverse, equitable environment. But you have to give that hand up and think about how am I making sure that I'm not assuming everyone comes in with this built-in knowledge. Mm. Yeah, indeed. The importance of having equitable on-ramps and recognizing and being honest about opportunities and access to training. And I love that image of giving people a hand up, getting everyone on board. That's so important. And we will absolutely come back to that a bit later. Uh, But Marta, coming over to yourself now, Primavera Sound is one of the best music festivals on the planet, the mouthwatering lineup every year. You know, you sell out the tickets before the full lineup is announced and people just trust it as a place where you will get the best, most interesting, most current, most impressive, most moving musical experience. And it's just wonderful. Now talk to us a bit about the role of diversity when it comes to selecting the lineup. And we've heard uh, from Andrea the advantages of having that diverse approach for business. What do you think are the advantages that diversity has for creative events and the creative industry? 
honestly, right now I'm just going to quit my job because I can't do better PR from my festival than the one that you, you just did. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. So, <laughs> so, okay, guys, it's been a pleasure to be with you for all these years. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I remember uh, the the interview that you were mentioning before. It was in 2019. Uh, yeah. It was a beautiful interview in a, in Forbes magazine, and I remember that it was very very early. Uh, we just uh, released the the lineup that year, and it was the first fifty fifty gender balance in a festival. At our site, of course, uh, there had been like smaller initiatives, but that was the first major festival that um, accomplished that. But it was very yeah. early. So it was quite a bet on our side because we still had to hear some people, as Andrea was saying before, absolutely tone deaf, that they were saying, okay, it's up to you if you want to go bankrupt because of this. This is simply a terrible lineup. You're not going to sell any tickets. So mm, move forward maybe five months later, the Saturday on that edition, Primavera Sun 2019, It was sold out and it was the day where we welcomed most people in Parc del Forum. It was 60,000 people watching a kind of more classic act like James Blake, a reggaeton superstar from Colombia, J Balvin, and a girl from very, very close to Barcelona who is actually called Rosalia. So if this is not diversity actually working for profit of greedy people like us that want to make a living out of music, then I don't know what it is. So yeah, it can be diverse. It can be empowering. It can be engaging and it can be profitable because if you just want to look at it from a financial perspective, there will be more people that can be interested in that. I mean, you can't watch all the acts that we have at Primavera. We This next year, in 2022, we are going to have like 400 acts spread between two weekends. So just pick your cards. If you want to go and enjoy classic acts, I don't know, Massive Attack or mm, I don't know, Pavement, you can do that. But if you want to go and do an all-female day, you can also do that. So yeah, it's more people, it's more tickets, it's going to make more money for you. So if you want to see it from that perspective, it is also good for you. It's also good for businesses and you are creating new audiences. It's good for everybody. Amen. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> I, I was there. I had the great pleasure of seeing Rosalia live at Primavera Sound and it was my gig of the year. It was absolutely stunning. The audience was singing along, hanging on every word. It was really extraordinary. And coming over to yourself, Andrea, l- let's talk a bit about some more data because I, I like the way you kind of use data to illustrate your point. I think it's super important. Now, there was a report, the USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiative Report, and it was published last year, I think. They spoke to like 70 major and independent music companies, and they found that just 13.9 of top executives were from underrepresented racial or ethnic groups. 13.9% were women and 4.2% were black. But the report also very poignantly noted that half the US population are women and 14% are black and 40% identify with an underrepresented racial or ethnic group. I mean, this is quite the disparity. What's your take on the situation we're in now? Yeah. So Annenberg does a few studies. So the first one that they did was uh, for executives last year. They also do a study around the participation of women in the music industry on the creator front. Yeah. That they've been doing for eight years. And the the study that came out last year, I think a new one's about to come out because they do it every year. So probably in the next week or two, it should definitely be published. What it showed was that actually for women, only 20% of all creators in top charting music in the U.S., was from women, and that it's been at a standstill over the last eight years. So really, there has been no progress. So as much as we've all been talking about this for so many years, we really haven't made the progress, which we'll talk about a little bit more about maybe what we need to do a little differently. For me, the details on that are really very interesting because songwriters are at only 13% and producers, so women producers are only 2.6%. Oh, that's nuts. It's insane. So um, we have a long way to go. But this is where we want to connect some of these studies together, because you mentioned on the executive side, also equally like a lot of room to grow. Mm. And I would say very important to note is that when you look at participation in the music industry for people of color, that's 
more than half now, right? Mm. And it's very important that the artists who are the, the musicians also on the executive side have representation who support them because they need individuals that are helping manage their careers that understand who they are. It's an artistry, right? So you, the more on the executive side you're connected with the artists that you're representing, the better. And so we have a lot of room to grow because uh, as you mentioned on the executive side, so executives that are Black was only 4.2%. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's very low and we have a lot of room to grow to make that a lot better. And in my mind, as far as like, why there's such a disparity, we have to focus on it. Mm -hmm. It's just like in, I use a lot of analogy, bear with me. I feel like it just helps me like for for myself. (laughs) More more analogies are welcome. They help me understand things. You know, star athletes, right? Like what separates a star athlete from a regular athlete in the rest of the field? Mm. They sit there and they focus on the thing they're not good at. They will do their practice And they sit there and they practice that, you know, if they've got to like get that hockey puck into like the the corner from this other angle and then it's like not their strong arm or whatever, they sit there and practice it and practice it and practice it. In basketball, um, you know, Kobe Bryant was famously known for this. I mean, he's Mm -hmm. like arguably one of the most successful basketball players like of our time. Absolutely. And he was always the shortest. Yeah, he was was not tall, man. And, but he became very skilled because he practiced on the things that he wasn't good at. I think we've identified where the music industry is not good right now. So we've all got to practice and make a focused effort to make it better. And this is where all of us have to take an action. Yeah, absolutely. So, Andrea, I'm guessing if you were to give the music industry a report card at the moment, uh, it would say something like must try harder or, uh, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's getting, so again, I'm very curious to see what the Amberg study shows this next year. I would oh, yeah. say, and we'll talk a little bit about another study that I've worked on in a little bit, but I am seeing a lot of desire to do things differently mm. from the industry. So out of 10, I would give us a six. So not not a five. So it's not like just average. It's yeah. like, all right, let's, we're, we're moving in the right direction, in my opinion, anecdotally and seeing how things were a year ago versus now. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, I'm happy to hear that. And uh, Marta, how about yourself? If you wanted to give the music industry a mark in terms of how it approaches diversity, where would you place it? It depends on uh, the system that you use. Uh, Maybe if it's American system, I think that the six would be um, quite accurate. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's a new system here now in Spain, which is especially for smaller kids. Uh, Let's consider that uh, our business is like small kid, doesn't know much, needs to be trained. And uh, instead, in, in order to be like encouraging, they only say, uh, necesita mejorar. It, uh, necesita mejorar or uh, progresa adecuadamente. So it's progressing adequately. I think it is progressing adequately. It doesn't mean that we are in a good place yet. Yeah. Especially, I would like to think that we are really, really privileged uh, by the fact that we are able to have this conversation here today or in many other places because our business is quite open. Um, it's a, it involves culture, it involves creativity. There are lots and incredibly talented people out there working in this. So being able to have a conversation about diversity, this means a lot because sadly there are lots of people working in warehouses, working in supermarkets, working in our metros and buses and people who make rooms uh, in uh, hotels that can't have a conversation about diversity. So I would like to think that the fact that at least we are able to talk about this, to point out the defects and doing something to fix them means that we are progressing adequately. That doesn't mean that we are there yet, but I would like to to state the fact that we are incredibly privileged to be able to say this from a a point of view of uh, wealthy countries that can have this kind of conversations because sadly there are lots of people in our countries that can't have this and of course countries that that can't have this at all anywhere yeah yeah well so that's a very good point so you know the music industry it's making good progress it could go further it will go further we're all kind of on the same page but you know in the great scheme of things it's not the worst by a long shot so that's a very good point to uh to mention there marta thank you very much Coming over to yourself, Andrea, you mentioned the importance of data earlier. There's more studies you're involved in. And we had one of our previous guests 
on the Audio Talks podcast was a gentleman called Mark Mulligan from the mighty yes. Medea Research. Talk to us a bit about the work you're doing with Medea. Absolutely. So a little background. The study you're referencing is called Be the Change Women in Music. And the first version we did of it with Midia was last year. Uh, and I have a few of the stats from that that I can share today. But the, the second one is actually in flight now. The survey is being collected. And what drove doing the study, because there's a lot of other studies out there, is I joined TuneCore uh, back in 2015. And I actually didn't come from the music industry. I came from retail. So I'm a little bit still of a, of a newbie outsider. I still consider myself. And... What struck me so much was when I started learning about TuneCore clients is just how low the participation rate was of female creators on an open platform like TuneCore. So if you're not familiar with TuneCore, we essentially allow artists to uh, distribute their music to all of the digital stores. Um, so into Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, even the social platforms like TikTok and Facebook, et cetera. And we allow the artists with no gatekeeper, if you just got 10 bucks, put out a song, you can. And then we collect all their money for them. And it was just striking to me that in an open platform like that, only 28% of the creators were female. And it stayed that way for the first five years that I was at the company. And when I started working for my boss, Dennis, who is founder CEO of Believe, our parent company, he gave me my number one OKR, which was to help drive gender parity both within our company and as in the music industry. And I was like, all right, well, let's work on this. And I started looking around at all the studies and all the studies I could find, like the Annenberg we just reviewed, was really talking about what the, the gaps were in the music industry, but not about why. And, um, you know, if you are a person that is, okay, well, what do I do about this? How do I change the results? You have to uncover, like, what do you need to do differently? And so thus came this very different study we did with Media, which was to uncover why is there a gap in the music industry and this low participation from women. And I'll share a few of the insights that we learned last year. I'm very curious to see as we do the new version that's going to come out in mid-April, if there is progress. That's kind of like the, the big money question mark at this point. But what we learned out of the gate is kind of some of the things we suspected, which is that 81% of the women felt that they do not get the same access to resources and opportunities that their male counterparts do. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's 81%. Wow. And, you know, when you get into a little bit more about the why, two-thirds definitely cited as discrimination, including yeah. sexual harassment, objectification, mm -hmm. as a reason that they are then, you know, feeling this way and then not participating. Also, not having the same access to resources and opportunities. You know, I love what you're doing at the conference, right? I mean, we've heard the stories of these music festivals. There are 10 slots for a showcase. One of them is slated to a woman out of the 10. And then all the women are competing for that one slot. They do not get the same access to the opportunities that males do. And you have to make a deliberate effort to say, we are going to fill up the lineup to have a nice mix. Like you said, the headliner was like one, one male, one female. And so resources and opportunities. And then if you could only imagine that if this is the environment that you're in where you are feeling sexually harassed, you, you know, you're feeling ageism, you have lower pay, you, you know, the discrimination, you then don't have the same accesses to resources and opportunities as the male creators do, your confidence is going to be lacking. And so two fifths of female creators identify that they don't feel the confidence. So it's like a vicious cycle, right? So mm -hmm. uh, this is why they are not participating in the industry, even on you know, when there is no barrier. And when we look ahead to understand what we can do differently, this is where there is a little bit of a potentially opportunity. So they want to see more women role models. That is a big, big reason. You know, it's really great that I'm so glad I'm on, on here um, with you, Marta. You know, I think we as women have a job to play that we need to stand up and say, hey, look at us. We're here. We're in the music industry. We're in our roles. We're women. We're strong. You can do it, too. And, you know, the more that women can be visible and, and, and participate and encourages other women that they think that it's possible. And that's very, very important. Also, you know, they want more access to resources and opportunities. And this is where we that are in our roles need to create those. You know, something that I've been doing is like, how do we, how do we start creating access to more education for our women? How, you know, I'm working with Key Change right now. We did 
a pilot last year at Reaper Bond, where we created a series of master classes and workshops specifically for women around production. I've worked with like Native Instruments, FL Studios, with Groover. We had both Songtrust and Centric talking about music publishing awesome. and, and went into like helping longer forms, so like two hour sessions to help women understand under the hood and not be afraid to ask the dumb questions where they will feel they're in a safe space to learn and not be like shot down. You know, this is another thing, you know, just to kind of illustrate a couple of these examples. I mean, I'm talking about the stats, but let's let's give the real life examples because I think that's what really brings it home mm-hmm. is I mentioned in the Annenberg study, only 2.6% of producers are women, Right guess what? Like I've talked to some female producers and they go into the studio and they'll present an idea. And, you know, it's a very collaborative environment, right? Mm -hmm. Music creation is very collaborative and their ideas will get shot down, forces them to work alone, you know? And so we need in the more technical roles, especially, and this is why resources are so important. Mm -hmm. We need to be, I don't know what's creating this unconscious bias for everybody that like women can't be in a technical role, but it exists. And you just hear example of example of where this is happening. Another great one is, you know, if you are a woman and you don't fit that stereotype of a female fronted band where you're like the lead singer and then all the other, the mix of the mixed gender group is all male. Like if you are by chance in an all male group, but you're the bassist or you're the sound engineer or whatever, you go to these festivals and, you know, just the staff doesn't think you're a part of the band. Uh, they, they will say they think you're a groupie or you are a girlfriend or a wife, but they, they can't. And, and so again, we have to, this is where it's kind of broken to be totally honest, just to put a little meat on the bones. When we talk about discrimination, what we're talking about, this is what we need. We need to change. And it takes an active effort from everybody to provide resources, opportunities, check our bias. You know, there's things we can all do to actually make this better. But we have to know where we are first. So this is where we did the first study last year. And I'm very excited to see how things have changed when we share on the results in April. Brilliant. Well, uh, thank you so much for the, all the work you're doing there uh, with Medea. That's just uh, incredible. There's an old saying, you can't improve something if you can't measure it. And I think it, it's it's really interesting to see how much women suffer from imposter syndrome. I don't know why. Uh, I don't know. It's because we have been brought up like that. Even if we were in a family that encouraged you, that told you that you could do anything you wanted. Uh, I don't know if we learned that from school. I don't know why. But I can tell you some of the people that are more talented, more powerful, more empowering in my environment, they are women. And they're constantly, we are constantly self doubting ourselves and uh, double thinking and kind of sabotaging because we have been told that we can't do this. So that also adds up to all these problems and issues that Andrea was pointing out, like the access to the resources or the how we have to fight for this one slot that there is available because you are there just to fill up a quota. So if there is a another black person, you can't be the second black person. Or if they have already a woman, you won't be the second woman. But also because even if we are there, because we deserve it, because we have been working so hard, because we had supporting system, because we got access to really good education or whatever, you are always uh, self-doubting, thinking, okay, but uh, wow, I'm a really, should I be here? Look at Andrea. She's amazing. She has all this data. Uh, I don't know. I just work in a music festival. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't be here. And that's what I've been hearing myself when she was talking is like, okay, she's amazing. Maybe I shouldn't be here. It should, should be someone else. And that happens a lot. And, and it's really, really difficult to, to, to break this, this vicious cycle, even if we are already here. So I just as um, an open call from, from here, women out there, please, the moment that you are looking at yourself in the mirror, thinking that you are not worth it, you have like, 17 women around you looking at you thinking, wow, she's so amazing, this thing that she is doing. So yeah, just think of that. For just one bad thought that you're having about yourself, there are 17 people around you, 17 women that are thinking, wow, you are so awesome. And Marta, just so you know, I go through imposter syndrome too. Like, uh, so we all do. Uh, we all I, do. Even, I talk a good game sometimes. I'm, I sound very confident, but we, I, I 100% agree that there's this wiring 
that um, I think it, it goes back to sort of the study. Like if you're in this environment where it is harder for women, you, you second guess yourself. Um, I had a really great discussion with a very senior executive at one of the music platforms who was talking about his trajectory as a leader, uh, as a male. And he shared with me that he had a counterpart that they were both up for the promotion. And the woman was way more skilled than him, way more skilled than him and could have done the job with her eyes closed. But, you know, he's the guy and he's like, yeah, I'll do it. And she was like, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I could do it, even though like totally like more skilled. And this is his account of it, by the way. So I don't know. (laughs) And then, uh, you know, I asked, okay, so you got the promotion, you know, he got it because if he was confident. And uh, I asked where, where the woman was and she was now like took some time out because her husband had a very successful career and just started consulting and taking care of the kids. And, but she could have been in where he was now, you know? And uh, this is where we as women also have to make an effort. It's a very, very important point where uh, we have to fill our space. They say that you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. And despite feeling how we feel, and I feel the same exact way that you mentioned, Marta, I feel that way all the time. And I have to remind myself, look in the mirror and say, I belong here. Mm -hmm. I am very skilled. I can do this. And, um, you know, we've got to remind ourselves that there's work we have to do, too. You know, there's work the industry has to do, but there's work we as women have to do to, you know, unwire ourselves from these many years of being in the environment that we're in. Well said, well said. Uh, To kind of paraphrase, feel the imposter syndrome, but do it anyway. The on-ramps are not equal. There are more obstacles for women in the music industry. There are more obstacles for folks from underrepresented minorities. But, uh, you know, this is what we all have to do is kind of make the on-ramps more equitable, more helpful, give more hands up. And, uh, And I love your call to arms there about breaking through that imposter syndrome and you know, I think anybody who's listening, if if you can do that, you'll be pleasantly surprised with the results. I think it, it always works in your favor to kind of break through that. And um, so I, I'd like to kind of ask both of you now a, a similar question. You know, you've given some great advice there about how companies, how individuals, how sectors can become more diverse. But how can we all become better allies and true champions for diversity. And, you know, is there anything that you would say to the men listening as well? What can we all do to help to move this forward? We know there's a million reasons why we need more diversity, more representation. We need a more equitable industry. How can we all help? And uh, we'll start with yourself, Andrea. Sure. So I'm a big believer that the best way you drive change is take action yourself. There's something all of us can do to make a difference. So if you are, for example, an individual, And you're looking at, okay, well, what can I possibly do in the music industry? Well, one, you can start by diversifying your music consumption. What are you listening to? That directly impacts the revenue for women. Are you going to festivals that is making gender parity a priority and support those organizations? Um, So that it's about putting your money, your personal money into, you know, where, what you believe in, in your values. Mm -hmm. Second, I would say, educate yourself. Learn about what are your personal bias? You know, what is the gap? And, you know, there's, you know, we mentioned a few of the studies on here. Read them. There's a lot of resources out there to make sure that you yourself are taking that action. And then nominate for diversity. There's a lot of really great programs out there. She Said So has an alt list that really highlights these more diverse groups. There is the Key Change Participant Program that actually helps women year round uh, through the program to actually get all the resources and opportunities that I've been talking about. Many, many others, but nominate for diversity. If you are a manager, and we talked a little bit more on the organization side, you know, as you're recruiting, are you taking that step to make sure your candidate pool is diverse? In some areas, it's hard. I mean, I'm in the intersect of music and tech. I'm a very big disadvantage because most tech developers are white males and it's very hard. But we make a very active effort to try to get fill up that pool with candidates before we start reviewing to make it as equal as possible, to make it more likely to get a more diverse pool between gender, ethnicity and race. Then how are you investing in learning and development? You know, we talked about that hand up. In your existing staff, you know, are you thinking about, you're assuming everyone comes in with this built-in knowledge. Guess what? You might need to get them like the equivalent of my, like, 
fundamentals of math course before I took statistics. What is the equivalent of that to help them get to that promotion? Because they could be very skilled. Again, I was very good at statistics, but I needed that pre-course. They are capable, but they might need that hand up. You need them to get a little extra education. Yeah. And then, you know, collaborate across the industry. One thing I really appreciated after the study came out with media last year is how much outreach I got from male counterparts to say, I want to work with you on this. And that's a very, very important thing I want to put out there is that this is not a problem that like for Marta and me, it is for also like our male counterparts to help participate and say, guess what? If there is more men at the top right now, and the only way you start like raising more women to get that hand up is that the men have to say, I'm going to help with this. And they're going to participate. And the fact that you're doing this session is wonderful. So thank you. I really want to appreciate that. So those are some things as a manager. I mean, as a company, you've got to set goals, measure against them. You know, like we we started doing a report regularly around what is our gender parity? What is our makeup of our ethnicity and race? Okay, where are we underrepresented? How do we like make sure we're taking some action here, both in like learning and development, also in recruiting to like make sure we're, we're kind of making a difference? Also, invest in diversity. This is like where you've got to put that money into the education. Mm -hmm. And then sponsor organizations that's helping drive this. You know, there's really great ones out there. I mentioned Key Change. She said so. There's Hyper Tribe, Color of Change, Women in Music. She is the music. There's a plethora of amazing organizations out there. And then lastly, if you are a member of an underrepresented group, cannot stress enough how important it is to build a support system around you. One thing I found really interesting from the media study last year is that a lot of women know of these organizations, but do not join them. Mm. And if you want to get more access to resources and opportunities, you've got to surround yourself with like-minded people because you will learn more about them. So join these organizations. Do not delay. Do it. (laughs) And, you know, be very honest. Also, that introspective work is very important where you have to understand where you're at. Where What do you need to work on? You know, um, something in my career that I had, I've always had to work on because I'm a very detail oriented person is to delegate better. It's my Kobe Bryant kind of like go sit there and practice, (laughs) you know, know? well, you have to know what your weaknesses are if you want to keep growing because when the opportunity comes, then you're ready essentially. And last thing is what I said earlier, which is you miss hundred percent of the shots that you don't take. So take them. Yeah. So, so that's my little, I kind of went a little long, sorry, but those are like my go-tos about everything all of us can do. Fantastic. Words to live by there. And what say you, Marta, what tips or requests or invitations would you have for our listeners? How can they become better advocates, better allies and better champions for diversity? Well, basically, Andrea covered them all, I think. (laughs) But yeah, of course, I I would uh, always go for look around you, try to see what's surrounding you. And if you can do something to spark more diversity, doesn't matter what it is, just do it. Uh, If you are in a position where you can hire someone, then think about it. It's always about thinking about it. I don't like that much the expression of the the violet or the pink glasses, but sure. okay, let's let's do it. Just try to look around you with a different point of view and say, okay, I'm lacking this here. So why don't we try to to hire someone that is not represented here um, at this moment? I think that perfect is the enemy of good. Of course, the quote is not mine, it's from Voltaire. So if he said so, probably he knew what he was talking about. And I remember back in 2019, we were asked a lot here. Um, I had uh, this question in many, many interviews. Like, okay, but you did it because maybe it was easy for you because um, you had more and more women progressively during the years. But there are lots of festivals that can't do it. And I would encourage to, okay, just Add some women, book more women. There is an uh, amazing uh, Twitter account that it's just like that. Book more women. Um, If you are just aiming for a 50-50 split lineup next year, if you have um, 1% of women in your lineup, of course, you're not going to do it from one year to the other. But every time that you hire a new female technician, every time that you give a good slot to a female van, every time that you rely on a female booker, uh, because maybe she has a different vision of the van that should be on stage, you are doing something. So just thinking uh, about getting there in a very self-imposed way, it doesn't work like that. Perfect is the enemy of of good, really. Um, That's sad. Don't, don't go there. And uh, then I would also think that 
uh, how how to say that that there are no bad answers or stupid questions at all because um i've also felt uh, lots of times that people are really maybe scared about asking they don't know they want to do better uh, and of course it's not our job to educate uh, educate anyone uh, as andrea said okay you can go and educate yourself but if you feel that there's something that you don't know or you would like to know or when you're Uh, questioned about, okay, what do you think that diversity is about? Unless you have a really, really terrible opinion on this and then you shouldn't say anything at all. Uh, just pointing out the, the, the doubt that you have or thinking, okay, I don't know how to do better. Just say it because it's not a stupid question. It's a very valid question. And if all of us were able to point that out clearly and say, okay, I don't know this. Maybe someone can explain it to me. Uh, I think that's good. Just uh, having honest conversations about uh, this this topics, I think it's uh, it's really good. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. So we hear there, you know, some of the great examples of things that all of our listeners can do. And we all need to be on the same page. We all need to be part of this solution because the world will be better. The music business will be better. And our very final question is a very important one because uh, we're all music lovers. Uh, it is to add a track to the Audio Talks title playlist. And um, we'll start with yourself, Andrea. Yes, um, I highly recommend Girls Can't Produce by Dominique, TuneCore artist who is a female producer. And uh, what inspired the song is she was putting out some music and got a very uh, discriminatory comment in her feed that girls can't produce. And so she wrote a song about it and went viral on TikTok with it. So uh, definitely check it out. It's a very peppy, awesome song. Awesome. I love it already. That's great. And Marta, what's your addition to our title playlist? I will say two and then you can pick. One is diverse, but not uh, in the gender aspect. Uh, it's Sante by Belgian artist Strome. The day that we're recording this podcast, he just released his new record. He is from a Rwandan father, Belgian mother, willingly gender fluid, androgen in his aesthetics. And Sante is a song about all those people that we don't notice. People who make our beds in hotels, people who serve our food, people who clean our toilets. So Sante toes to them. That would be one. And the other one is one of my all-time favorites, and they will be playing at Primera Sound 2022, the classic Riot Girl song. Rebel Girl by Bikini Kill. Oh, fantastic. My God. I mean, the, yeah, the lineup for Primavera Sound 2022 is awesome. We're going to link in the show notes. Absolutely. My addition to the playlist is uh, a very talented female producer, one of my absolute favorites. Hi. And she has done a remix of Love and Hate in a Different Time by Gabriel's. Thanks so much for joining us for that inspiring, honest, heartfelt chat. Thank you to Andrea Gleason. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. And uh, read those studies. Oh, for sure. We're going to link to them in the show notes as well so our listeners can educate themselves and get even more inspired. And muchísimas gracias a Marta Paleres Olivares. Muchísimas gracias a ti, Oishin. Go listen, all of you, more female artists. Uh, you will do good and you will feel better. 100%. And I just want to give a shout to our show sponsors, Harman, who last month launched a new strategic partnership with Girls Who Code that aims to help close the gender gap in engineering and other technology fields. Now, this new partnership is part of Harman Inspired. It's their global cause initiative created to prepare the next generation of technology leaders through unique, immersive and meaningful experiences in music, technology and community service. Listeners, don't forget to subscribe, comment and share with your friends and family. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we would really appreciate you taking a moment to give us a nice review on Apple or Spotify. It helps our audio talks reach more audio lovers around the world. And I have some exciting news. Now you can connect and interact with the Audio Talks podcast over on Instagram. We will be sharing some exclusive videos, updates and maybe even some competitions. So make sure to connect with at Audio Talks podcast and say hi. The link is in the show notes alongside some awesome resources to support diversity in the music business and beyond. We'll be back soon for some more fascinating audio talks. See you next time.